Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. It's the show that takes you inside the unbelievable, the unexplainable, the macabre, and the bizarre and tries to find an answer. Hello, Caroline. Hi. This week, uh, it's time to shiver your timbers and swab the poop deck, because it is time to talk about ghost ships on the podcast. Ooh, spooky. Uh, That's right. This week and next week, I've got uh, two shows chock full of spectral vessels for you. Um, Carrie, right off the bat, I want... Well, first of all, uh, when I say ghost ship, what what do you think of? Um, I think of, you know... That movie from the video store cover <laughs> with the skull on the front of the, the sure. steamship? Sure. Uh, I think of the, what is it, the Flying Dutchman and Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, uh, a haunting of a ship. I think we talked about in our New England UFOs episode some ghostly type ships that people thought might be UFOs. Um, I've heard some stories especially in Rhode Island, off of the coast of Newport, of some, like, ghost ships that are, you know, ships that are literally ghost specters, not really there. Yeah, um, there are sort of two different types of ghost ship, two different things that people apply that name to. Uh, A ghost ship is, of course, um, the thing that comes to mind first, the Pirates of the Caribbean-esque Um, you know, a spectral vessel crewed by the dead, Mm -hmm. uh, whether they're victims of some horrible curse or specters of, you know, sailors lost at sea, they're, uh, doomed to forever roam the, the Spanish main or, or whatever. Sure. Um, but ghost ship can also refer to a ship or, uh, other boat that's recovered adrift and abandoned on the open seas. Yes with its crew having vanished seemingly into thin air. And there's more of those incidents than you might expect. Certainly more than I'd hope. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but we're going to start our, uh, our fun today with the king of all ghost ships, Carrie, as you just mentioned, the Flying Dutchman. Mm-hmm. I know it from SpongeBob as well, right? Yes, uh, not, <laughs> not invented for SpongeBob or for Pirates <laughs> of the Caribbean 4 or whichever one. That shows. Is it uh, Davy Jones's ship in, in the, those movies? I think it shows up in the second one. So it's Davy Jones's uh, ship is called the I Flying Dutchman. I believe so, yeah. Okay. Um, in legend, the Flying Dutchman is a ghost ship send, said to be captained by a man condemned to forever sail the seas, never allowed to make port again. So I think that part of the legend is kind of... Uh, they stick true to that part in the pirates thing, don't they? Isn't that yeah, Davy well, Jones's Dav- kind of yes, thing? Yes, that's Davy Jones's thing. And so this is a ship that is crewed by ghosts, and the ship itself is a ghost. The ship itself does seem to be a ghost. It um, is usually seen as a black form of a ship looming on the horizon, or seemingly flying over the horizon, mm. um, often upside down for added spookiness. Also very steampunky. It's very steam... What, the upside down part? Not the upside down part. Oh, the flying ship. Yes. Yes. Uh, where an airship isn't like a Zeppelin, it's just like a boat that flies. Yeah, that they kind of did that in Fallout, didn't they? Um. Well, there were those robots that uh, had mm-hmm. the ship that they desperately wanted to get up into the air. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Mm-hmm. Um, legend has it that if the Dutchman is hailed by another ship... Its crew will try to give them messages to pass on to their loved ones on land, or maybe to loved ones long dead. Uh, And seeing it was viewed as the worst possible omen uh, a superstitious sailor could encounter on the seas. Hmm. Now, the first print reference to the Flying Dutchman comes from a John MacDonald uh, writing of his travels in 1790. On one day, he wrote, The weather was so stormy that the sailors said they saw the Flying Dutchman. The common story is that this Dutchman came to the Cape in distress of weather and wanted to get into harbor but could not get a pilot to conduct her and was lost, and that ever since, in very bad weather, her vision appears. So it was kind of an urban legend at the time. Yes. Already. Yes, from that and from other references right around the same time toward the end of the 18th century, we can sum up the uh, general folk belief among sailors as this. Uh, The Dutchman was a Dutch schooner or man of war, probably working for the East India Company, uh, lost near the Cape of Good Hope. Cape of Little Hope, I guess. Um, 
in some versions of the story, there was a partner vessel out with the Dutchman. But when the partner vessel returned and got its repairs done, they saw the Dutchman once again sailing right beside them, out to the horizon, only to disappear whenever they got close. Uh, later, superstition and oral tradition would sometimes include a, a pirate captain or a pirate crew that were cursed for their uh, wicked lives and ill deeds, never to return to port again uh, and see their families. Oh, dear. There were many reported sightings, hundreds of sightings of the Flying Dutchman throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, it's not surprising that that's when this story kind of flourished. Um, the East India Company was uh, just owned much of the Atlantic Ocean uh, in effect, and I think their outsized influence on the waters was uh, kind of reflected in this legend in a way, mm-hmm. because it's a it's a Dutchman. Um, one especially notable uh, sighting was by one King George V, oh. um, when he was just Prince George of Wales in 1880. Uh, George was on a voyage with his brother, Prince Albert Victor, and their tutor, John Neil Dalton, off the coast of Australia. Uh, actually, the giant, like, comically oversized boat that they were in for this voyage had uh, blown a rudder or something, so they were on a smaller boat um, while theirs got repairs when the following entry, July 11th, at 4 a.m., the Flying Dutchman crossed our bows. A strange red light, as of a phantom ship all aglow, in the midst of which light the masts, spars, and sails of a brig two hundred yards distant stood out in strong relief as she came up on the port bow, where also the officer of the watch from the bridge clearly saw her, as did the quarterdeck midshipman, who was sent forward at once to the forecastle. But on arriving there, there was no vestige nor any sign whatever of any material ship was to be seen either near or right away to the horizon, the night being clear and the sea calm. Thirteen persons altogether saw her. At 10.45 a.m., the ordinary seaman who had this morning reported the Flying Dutchman fell from the four topmast cross trees onto the topgallant forecastle and was smashed to atoms. Jeez. He knew what atoms were? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> very small pieces. <laughs> Jeez. He knew, that, he knew that much, at least. Yeah, so you can see the kind of omen angle of the Dutchman right there. Sure. As the guy who announced it coming up, up on the bow. Ends up falling to a, a horrible death, like, immediately afterward. Yikes. Now, when you hear about the Dutchman, when you hear about how it appears, does anything in particular jump out as, like, a, an explanation? Maybe it's a cloud that's kind of gone lower to the ground. Maybe it's fog. Um, one explanation that's been offered is a, a mirage. A mirage sees atmospheric refraction. We talked about this actually a little bit in our round Earth episode. Mm -hmm. Flat Earth episode. Well, I think we proved it's a round Earth. (laughs) Um, As light waves bend, uh, an object that's just over the horizon can appear as a reflection upside down in the sky just over the horizon. Oh. Which is a direct explanation for the... Like, a lot of the time, the sailors describe something upside down and in the sky. The upside down thing is very interesting. Yeah. Um, So there you have it. There's not too much more to say about the Flying Dutchman. I thought we should definitely give it its due as the, you know, origin and king of all ghost ships. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it's safe to say that um, if you're out on the waters, that's not one of the things you need to worry about. the, (laughs) The ghostly Flying Dutchman. You know, as a kid, along with quicksand, I thought that I would be experiencing mirages a lot more than I ended up doing. Uh, yeah, the well, the cartoon like desert version of a mirage, where the heat turns ju- just creates you know palm trees and a, a, a an oasis in in the middle of the desert, or turns your friend into like a steak, mm-hmm, a Coca Cola machine in the middle of vast sand yes uh yeah not that kind of mirage the bugs bunny kind of mirage <laughs> uh, but you're right i did think those would play a lot more into my um my i don't life. think i've ever experienced one uh one last note if you do see the dutchman out on the waves and the crew does ask you to take messages to their loved ones back on land um it is said that you shouldn't take the messages because bad luck will befall any ship carrying those faded letters that's too bad 
It is. Well, you know, it's kind of circumventing the curse. Can't let these guys get off their their punishment for whatever it was they did. (laughs) They never really explain it? No. Hmm. Pirate. I mean, sometimes it's a pirate captain, so there's an implied list of murders and thefts there, I guess. I guess. But didn't the East India Company uh, deal in a lot of slaves? Uh, That's true, too. So... That doesn't come up as as part of the morality play here. Hmm. Funny that. Yeah. Now, perhaps the most famous of the other type of ghost ship is the Mary Celeste. Uh, The Mary Celeste was an American merchant brigantine. That's a two-mast wooden ship uh, that was found adrift off of the Azores Islands in Portugal. I don't know how my... The uh, Azores. (laughs) The Azores Islands off of Portugal. Which my family supposedly comes from. There you go. Well, that is where the Mary Celeste was found adrift December 4th, 1872 by the Canadian merchant ship De Gratia. Hmm. That's Latin. I don't know why the Canadians were putting on airs there, but... Very fancy. Yeah, and your <laughs> denim jackets or whatever. <laughs> when found, the Celeste was called disheveled but seaworthy. She was under partial sail. Um, her lifeboat was missing. And the last log entry had been dated nine days before. Uh, Most strangely, perhaps, the cargo, 1,701 barrels of denatured alcohol, uh, was completely intact, and the personal belongings of the crew, captain, and a couple of passengers were completely undisturbed. Hmm. Yet, none of the crew were ever seen or heard from ever again. So, what happened? What what was in the log? Well, let's uh, rewind a little bit. Okay. Okay. Uh, The Mary Celeste was built in Nova Scotia in 1861, but it first launched from England as uh, as a ship called the Amazon. It has been speculated by some that the Mary Celeste was cursed. We've dealt in curses before on this podcast. Cursed towns, cursed families, cursed mummies. (laughs) This would be our first cursed boat. Um... If she was cursed, it started bearing its uh, fateful fruit immediately. Because There's no, like, story behind it being cursed? No, there's no, like, uh, it was built on an Indian burial ground. <laughs> well, or I mean, you know. On her maiden voyage, the captain, Robert McClellan, fell ill and died. Um, very suddenly, it sounds like. Like, they got out uh, after their first stop into back into the, the bay. He got real sick. They had to turn around, and he died like two days later in the port. Yikes. Now, they found another captain and set out again, but after that, on the same voyage, she collided with fishing equipment off the coast of Maine, and then uh, made her transatlantic voyage, got to the English Channel, and then promptly ran into a brig, uh, which sank. That just sounds like very bad... (laughs) <laughs> well, it sounds like Mr. Bean is driving this thing. Yeah, I mean, like, what are they doing? Uh, I don't know. I don't it know was, if that's a curse or just someone drunk at the helm. It was an inauspicious start, and they did have to get a replacement captain hastily after their first one died. So uh, maybe they, you know, didn't get a, a quality replacement or something on short notice. Mm-hmm. After that, the ship did operate quietly and profitably for at least six years. Until in October 1867, she was driven ashore in a storm and abandoned by the then owners as a wreck. Hmm. Uh, Said wreck was sold as a derelict, uh, repaired, and eventually transferred to American registration in 1868 under the new name Mary Celeste. Do we know what the origins of that name is? Um, No, we don't know why it was named Mary Celeste. Um... And neither did new owner James Winchester, who bought the ship shortly after in 1869. So he wasn't even the one who uh, named it. The owner was actually a shifting consortium of investors, sort of. Mm -hmm. It's like half a dozen different guys shifting in and out. But uh, always at least half of the shares were owned by this James Winchester. So he was the man in charge. Well, we know plenty about Winchesters being cursed. (laughs) Yes. uh, Different different Winchester family and uh, possibly a different curse. (laughs) But as of 1872... Different families, same curse. <laughs> um, as of 1872, Winchester had six of 12 shares in the boat. 
There were two minor investors with a share apiece, and the remaining four were held by the captain, Benjamin Briggs. Uh, Captain Briggs was a godly man who had been born in April 24th, 1835, in Wareheim, Massachusetts, uh, to a father who was also a sea captain named Nathan Briggs. That sounds like it sort of ran in the family. Actually, three of Nathan's other four sons also became sailors. Well, Briggs is a very sailory name. Yeah, you almost don't have a choice, right? <laughs> um, and being a Briggs from Massachusetts, maybe he didn't have a choice here either. He married his cousin, Sarah Elizabeth Cobb. Well, you always have a choice. <laughs> in 1862. Um, it wasn't a loveless marriage, I don't think. They had a son uh, named Arthur in 1865, and then a daughter named Sophia in 1870. Well, you could at least say it wasn't a sexless marriage. Whether there was love there, who knows? <laughs> I think he did enjoy being at home because we're told that Benjamin Briggs, after having the second kid especially, really started thinking about settling down. And he and his brother thought about pooling their money to start some kind of a land-based business. Should have done it, Ben. Uh, yeah, they ended up deciding to stick with what they knew. Both of them were sea captains. And each of them took his money and invested in a different ship instead. And that brought us to October 1872, when the Mary Celeste was finally ready to depart for Italy on its uh, first voyage as the Mary Celeste, after an extensive refit in New York shipyards. Uh, first mate Albert Richardson was brought on. He was uh, Winchester's nephew through marriage, and he had sailed with Briggs before, so he was, you know, uh, well known to everybody. Uh, there was a second mate, Andrew Gilling, from New York. Uh, the steward, Edward William Head, had been personally recommended by Winchester, and they we found... We love Ed Head. <laughs> uh, Ed Head, um, Ed, I think Ed Head acquitted himself admirably on this uh, voyage until till he vanished. Well. They also found four um, German sailors described as uh, peaceful and first-class seamen. Uh, their names were Volkert Lorenzen and Bos Lorenzen. Those were brothers. Uh, Arian Martins and Gottlieb Godschall, because we need the most German name of Arian? all time. Arian? What? Arian? Arian Martins. That's yep. too bad. And Gottlieb Godschall. Wow. Uh, his wife, Sarah, and the infant, Sophia, came along on the voyage as well. School-aged Arthur was left at home with his grandmother. Now, if I know anything from Pirates of the Caribbean... <laughs> Uh, it's that, that women were bad luck on ships or seen as that. Is that true? Uh, I didn't see it come up in this story. I'm sure different, th that seems like the kind of thing that would be a tradition that varies from ship to ship and port to port and sailor to sailor. Um, just found it interesting that there was a woman yeah, and a girl, I guess, on the ship. Absolutely. And, and not a totally standard thing. Thing. But no. this was the first um, voyage on this new boat. You know, maybe he figured... Um, nice little pleasure cruise. Nice pleasure cruise across the Atlantic for his wife. And, and again, infant daughter. That's a big swing. Now, the Canadian brigantine De Gratia, which I, managed, which I mentioned before, uh, lay in port in Hoboken while the Mary Celeste prepared for sale in New York City. Uh, the captain, David Morehouse... His, his widow said 50 years after this that her husband, David Morehouse, uh, was very close friends with Benjamin Briggs and that the two captains dined together the night before Mary Celeste left. Interesting. Um, she's the only corroboration on that, but it does seem historians have agreed it's possible because uh, the two guys seem to have common interests and they were both in this, the kind of Northeast sailing biz. And uh, it does seem like they knew each other. It's unclear how close they were. Why would she lie about it? Uh, I don't know. It could just kind of aggrandizing the legend a little bit because of the role that De Gratia will play in the rest of the story. Mm. In any event, the Canadian steamer left eight days after the Mary Celeste. In any event, the Canadian ship left eight days after the Mary Celeste and traveling along roughly the same route. Mm -hmm. So the Mary Celeste was going to be delivering a bunch of alcohol to Italy? Yeah, denatured. Um, what is... It, it's... Uh, there's another word for it, too. Uh, denatured alcohol is like rubbing alcohol. It's alcohol that has had um, basically poison added to it so that it's not <laughs> safe to drink. Great. But they still do do it, so you can't just chug rubbing alcohol. Watch me. I mean, you can. It'll just... 
you'll die. <laughs> I know. Um, it's, isn't it an interesting solution, though? It's like, yeah, people are drinking too much rubbing alcohol, and it's killing them eventually. It's like, well, make it kill them now. <laughs> it's like, well, it's one okay. strategy. Anyway, that's what they were hauling. On December 4th, 1872, the De Gratia was halfway between the Azores and the Portuguese mainland. And Captain Morehouse was walking on deck when the helmsman reported a vessel about six miles away, closing with De Gratia slowly and erratically. Uh, no one could be seen on deck, and there was no response to signals from the Canadian ship. Morehouse sent the first and second mate once they'd gotten close enough to the ship to see the name Mary Celeste painted on the side. Uh, they climbed aboard and quickly found it deserted. The sails were partly set and in poor condition. Some of them were actually missing altogether. Uh, the rigging uh, was also damaged, the two mates noted, with the ropes hanging loosely over the sides of the ship. Uh, the main hatch was right in the middle of the boat. That was closed and secured. But smaller hatches in the fore and aft of the ship were open, with the covers lying next to them. Uh, one of them had the cover lying right next to it. The other one had the cover lying like a few feet away and kind of propped up on something. Hmm. The single lifeboat of the ship had been a yawl, uh, kind of a big rowboat, stored across the uh, main hatch. That was missing and its ropes had been cut. Oh, okay. The the compass binnacle, the like, I don't know, stand that a compass s sits on on the ship, uh, had shifted had been shifted from its place and the glass had been broken. Uh, I can't tell if that means the compass is missing, but I assume it does, because all the rest of the navigation equipment had been taken off the, the boat. I need this compass! So so it seems like they left on the rowboat. Uh, one last thing. There was also a makeshift sounding rod that had been abandoned on the deck. Oh, what's that used for? Uh, a sounding rod is a device used for checking the amount of water in a ship's hold. So it's like a, something you use to, to see how much water your ship is taking on. Mm-hmm. So someone had made one and then abandoned it on board when they left. Well, once you, once you know how much water there is, you don't need to take it with you, especially if you're not taking anything else. Um, you asked about the ship's log before, didn't you? I did. It was found in the mate's cabin, and the last entry had been November 25th, nine days before. Mm -hmm. uh, the entry records a position off an island in the Azores that was nearly 400 nautical miles away. From where the ship was found. From where the ship was found, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, walking through the rest of the ship, the sailors found that the interiors were wet, but reasonably orderly, and there wasn't much missing. Um, the ship's papers and navigational instruments, the ship also still had ample provisions in the stores. Um, there was no food, like, actively being prepped. It's not like, oh, there was a, they were in the middle of a meal when mm -hmm. they left, um, but there was a lot of food left. It's not like they were running out. And there was no obvious evidence of fire or violence throughout the ship. Mm -hmm. The Del Gratia crew had a, a what sounds like a lot of trouble um, getting the Mary Celeste the 600 nautical miles to Gibraltar. Yeah, it doesn't sound like an easy job. Uh, because they had enough guys to sail their boat. Period. <laughs> and <laughs> it's not like you just hook up a tow hitch, right? They had to take half of their guys... Like, the, the two first mates and one other guy, basically, had to sail the Mary Celeste by themselves. Plus, it had already taken on water, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, but not much, actually. Okay. Uh, they That was later determined to be from just a malfunctioning pump or something. Mm -hmm. Not a danger to the boat at all. But it was very slow progress. Like, they took three or four times the amount of time they wanted to get from the Azores to Gibraltar. Yeah. But they were expecting a big salvage payout at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. The salvage court hearings started in Gibraltar in December 1872, uh, Advocate General Frederick Solly Flood presiding. What's it with all these nautical names? Um, historians Lionel and Patricia Fanthorpe, who wrote a book on this uh, story, uh, describe uh, when they're talking about Solly Flood, they say his, quote, arrogance and pomposity were inversely proportional to his IQ. Interesting. And this guy, Solly Flood, heard DeVoe and Wright, the two mates' uh, testimonies, and basically just went, well, a crime's been committed here, for sure. Oh. Has to be. Uh, <laughs> local papers reported that, quote, 
The inference is that there's been foul play somewhere, and that alcohol is at the bottom of it. It was the bottom of the ship, but that was about it. The Mary Celeste was investigated by John Austin, the surveyor of shipping. Uh, With the help of a diver, he found that the ship's hull hadn't been involved in a collision or run aground. Um, But he thought there were cuts on each side of the bow that had probably been caused by a sharp instrument like a sword. Like purposeful cuts. Hmm. He also noted a vial of sewing machine oil that was found upright in its place. And he said, well, how could the ship have been hit by a storm if there's just open bottles that aren't fall- that haven't fallen over inside? Yeah, maybe. Could the bow thing, could it have been like they were cutting ropes or something and they hit the bow when they cut the rope? Oh, that's a g- great theory. Uh, th- th- there's another possible explanation that I'll get to uh, in a little bit. But the supposition of the investigators was that the crew had hacked up the front of the boat to kind of make it look like they'd hit something. Oh. To what end? Uh, To make it look like the boat had been in an accident when actually they were, you know, doing whatever they were doing, abandoning ship for some reason. But they were never found. So again, what to what end? I agree. (laughs) Um, But they were going with this like mutiny or conspiracy hypothesis Uh, And the investigators also found uh, one deep mark that they said, quote, was possibly caused by an axe. Uh Uh-huh. And a few dark stains on a railing that they felt could have been blood. Um, Briggs's sword was also found stowed and in its sheath beneath his bunk. Uh, There were a few dark stains on the blade that they thought, well, maybe this is blood, too. And that was about the sum total of the evidence from the investigation. Nonetheless, on January 22nd, Flood reported his official findings and opinions to the trade board in London. Where he said, well, the crew obviously got at the alcohol and murdered their officers and the Briggs family in a drunken rampage and uh, cut the bow with their swords to simulate a collision. Wouldn't they have been poisoned by this denatured alcohol? Yes, they would have, Carrie. I'm so glad you asked. (laughs) Also, this is a ship that had been wrecked before. Do we know for certain that it didn't have these kinds of defects? Because these seem like cosmetic defects that you might not replace if you're just trying to get it up and running again. Uh, Yeah, that's... Absolutely true. And also there was a U.S. Navy captain who testified in this case, sent in like written testimony Mm -hmm. that the marks on the bow were exactly the kind of thing that comes from the natural action of the ocean. They Mm. were about at the waterline and and could have just been natural kind of water erosion of the wood. Mm -hmm. So there's that too. Oh, and analysis of the stains showed they weren't even actually blood. Was it on the poop deck? (laughs) No, it was not. (laughs) Although maybe they made it one. Well, what were the stains? I don't know. Not blood. Not blood. Okay. It was it was 1873. They didn't do like a a complex molecular analysis. <laughs> well, I'm assuming their their blood analysis is just some Tasting guy it. licking his finger, licking uh, you know, like sweeping it against the stain and then licking it again. Oh, it's not blood. Um, Flood did his best to keep Morehouse and his crew's um, salvage payments away from them. Uh, saying they must have been hiding something, they must have been involved somehow, and obviously doctored the ship's log, since there was no way, he said, that wreck had made it 600 miles in open ocean without a crew. Mm -hmm. Um, In the end, the Mary Celeste, the evidence was overwhelming against Solly Flood's um, uh, preferred interpretation, and so uh, finally the ship was released on February 25th, And on April 8th, uh, a reward amount of 1,700 pounds was announced for the salvage. Um, Not a bad amount of money, but Morehouse and his crew thought that they deserved at least three times that amount. Mm -hmm. It was only like, usually you would get like more than half the value of the ship and the cargo if you brought something in like that. Mm -hmm. And this was like maybe a fifth of the total value. That's lame. Why? Uh, I I think they were just able to go like, well, it still looks like something shady is going on here, so we're only willing to pay out this amount. (sighs) Um, So, let's talk about theories. Mm -hmm. 
Um, because the main thing here is, okay, yes, it does look like the crew abandoned ship, right? But, but why? Why? Well, did they think it was sinking? Um, they could have. They could have. There is that sounding rod. Mm-hmm. And, um, there is water inside. Mm-hmm. And structural investigation of the ship found um, malfunctioning pumps um, or some other like very minor mechanical problem had brought a little bit of water on board. <laughs> Um, and it was speculated Briggs could have mistaken the ship for sinking, you know, hence the, uh, sounding rod and prematurely ordered the crew to abandon ship. It's mm-hmm. possible. Um, foul play, of course, is possible. That's what, uh, Mr. Solly Flood, uh, contended. Uh, he also contended, he, in the newspapers reported at the time that the Mary Celeste was probably overinsured for what its value was. So that's a little suspicious. It's like, oh, maybe they were trying to get a a nice big payout here for this junker they bought. Yeah, or maybe it had already been wrecked and they wanted to be pretty secure about it because, you know, it might not have been as stable as a new ship. Yep. And if this was a legitimate line of inquiry, um, no insurance company ever found it, took it seriously enough to make an inquiry. Like no Mm -hmm. insurance company ever followed up on this. Mm -hmm. So unlikely that this was insurance fraud. Um, it could have been a conspiracy. They, and Flood had also sort of played at this, right? Maybe De Gratia, uh, was paid by the owner of the boat Mm -hmm. to catch up, lay in wait by the Azores, lure Briggs and his crew aboard and kill them there. Then, uh, you know, James Winchester gets to take a fat insurance payment on the boat and Morehouse gets a salvage payment and everybody wins. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit. Well, except for the people on the boat that were murdered, they don't win. Uh, That's true. And you have to kill a baby to, to do all this. It's also a theory. This was brought up at the time, but it doesn't work at all because De Gratia was actually like considered the slower ship of the two. Right. And it left eight days later. So there's just no way. No one thinks it could have caught. How is James Winchester's, like, wealth at this time? Was he having issues? Was he struggling in any way? No, I believe he was a wealthy businessman, and this was one of several concerns, business concerns he had. Yeah, I mean, if it wasn't a thing where it's like he's got a gambling problem or whatever, and he needs money fast, why would you do this? It's true. Okay, okay. So I'm trying to find an angle that works here. Maybe Morehouse and Briggs were working together. Well, where did Briggs go? Um, We talked about how Briggs and Morehouse might have been buddies, right? Similar circles, similar interests. There was that story about them getting dinner. So what if Briggs's crew was paid or otherwise silenced, and Briggs and his wife and daughter took their part, uh, their cut of the salvage money and ran? No, it, it, it wasn't Briggs's wife and daughter. What? Because it was Briggs's widow that said they were friends, right? No, Morehouse. Oh, so the captain had his wife and daughter on the ship. The captain who disappeared. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. So, okay. Hmm. Now, the problem here is Briggs does leave his son behind <laughs> in that scenario. <laughs> that is pretty messed up, yes. The only thing to recommend it is like, well, yeah, wait, why did he bring his wife and daughter aboard? Is it so he could escape with his ill-gotten gains? Maybe he didn't like his son. But what is he taking? He's taking one fifth of seventeen hundred pounds, and that's his big. Why didn't he bring his son? Right. Well, because this probably isn't real. That's what I. I, I think. No, but in general, why didn't he bring him? School age. The son was in school. Oh. A voyage like this takes months, so you don't. Uh, you can't bring him along. Hmm. Um. There were Riffian pirates from Morocco that were active in that area around the Azores at the same time. Mm-hmm. However, the Mary Celeste was very, very unlooted. Yeah, that's a lot of alcohol to leave behind. None of the supplies were taken, none of the alcohol was taken, and again, none of the personal effects were even really uh, looted. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was suggested by one historian, uh, John Gilbert Lockhart, in 1925, that Briggs, who was a very religious guy, he was a stern kind of religious figure uh, and very, very active at church, And so this guy, John Gilbert Lockhart, said, well, what if Briggs killed everyone aboard 
and himself. Like a like instead of a family annihilator, it's like a, a crew, crew annihilator. annihilator. Uh, in a fit of religious mania. There's no evidence to support it in any way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, he was kind of, in fact, at the time when this guy suggested it, Briggs's like surviving family members. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'd be pissed too. Loudly came out against him and he, he retracted the theory. <laughs> What if it was a rogue wave? Um, it could have been. The boat wasn't really damaged that much. But you said it was wet inside. It was wet So inside. if it was just a wave. They've talked about um, a wave or, or water spouts. There could have been a sea quake or something that uh, caused a bunch of water to get onto the boat and spooked everyone. Um, let's talk about that lifeboat, right? Yeah, I mean, the the ropes are cut, so that kind of... I can explain away the lifeboat being gone and everyone else being gone by a rogue wave, but not if the ropes are cut. Right. So that was clearly on purpose. Um, Oliver Cobb, who is a cousin of Briggs, who uh, became very fascinated with this and did a lot of research after the fact, um, he speculated that the crew were transferred to the lifeboat as kind of a temporary precaution. Mm-hmm. Um. He even looked at the cut-up rigging. Remember I mentioned some of the ropes were like hanging over the side yes. of the ship. He said, well, maybe that some of that stuff was cut down to secure the lifeboat to the ship so it wouldn't drift away. Because the crew wasn't getting on the lifeboat to definitely escape, but just to wait something out because they thought something dangerous might be happening with the ship. So why would they cut the ropes after that? They wouldn't, but if the line accidentally parted where they had tied it, they could have found themselves drifting away from a ship that they never could catch up to because the Mary Celeste, of course, had sails. And uh, so it, you're never going to paddle up to it if you if the line parts and the ship just starts drifting away. But the line was cut. Uh, the line securing the lifeboat to the ship in the middle of the deck, mm-hmm. that was cut. I see. So what he's saying is they must they have tied, tied it, it with another way. rope. Yeah. And then that line could have parted, and, and all of a sudden, oh no, there it goes. Mm-hmm. Um, so what could this ominous thing have been? What could have uh, driven them off the boat? Well, the ship's log references ominous rumbling sounds and small explosions below the decks. Um, these are, from what I understand, pretty common sounds. Um, when you're carrying a large cargo of petroleum, for example, or denatured alcohol, uh, because these are flammable liquids that are constantly giving off flammable gases. So there are small explosions happening. That doesn't seem good on a wooden boat. Um, one of the hatch covers, remember I mentioned one of the hatch covers was found in like a weird position Mm -hmm. a little further away. Mm -hmm. Cobb actually speculates that maybe there was one bigger than normal explosion. That actually blew the hatch off one of the uh, cargo holds. And then everybody goes, okay, <laughs> let's let's head into the lifeboat just in case. Well, wouldn't there be like evidence of an exploded barrel or something like that? Um, yes, that was not found. But it wouldn't have to be an exploded barrel. It's just gases leaking out of these barrels. So it's the hatch that pops and not the barrel. Yeah, some spark happens and any source of spark or ignition is going to set off some pops in that um, room. Hmm. So he even gave the example of, you know, and then uh, there's a couple noises happening and then a crewman walks down there with a cigarette and then kaboom and then, uh uh-oh, let's let's get off the boat. (laughs) Now, historians all basically agree that this was a terrible idea either way. Because if you're in a life, if you're afraid the ship is going to what explode, you don't want to be in a lifeboat that's tied to it. Absolutely not. Well, I mean, it's weird that if they thought if they thought something was wrong, why would you still be tied to the boat? Like if it was sinking, it's just going to bring you down with it. Exactly. And experts say the reality is even if there was an explosion, but like if the ship quote blew its timbers. If it was structurally destroyed, uh, clinging to the wreckage of the Mary Celeste would still be a better option for survival in the open sea than this lifeboat. Really? Yeah. Why? Because no one's ever going to find you. And the Mary Celeste is just bigger and easier to see? Yeah. Hmm. 
So that's that. I mean, that's all. That's all. <laughs> that's all of the theories. The most likely thing I think is that uh, yes, they thought the boat was either sinking or something bad was happening. They all piled into the lifeboat, and, and they might not have tied themselves to the ship. Right? They might have fully panicked and gone, "This ship is sinking. We need to get off." Mm-hmm. Got into a lifeboat, and then just—I mean, lifeboats just vanish because they're so small, and the ocean is so large, and you can't control where you're going. They didn't have paddles? Oh, I, in open seas, that doesn't matter. You can't really paddle yourself. Hmm. Yeah, I think... Yeah, either that or a rogue wave. But I like I like them choosing the lifeboat better because of the cut ropes. That, to me, says that there was a choice to at least take it down from where it was in the middle of the deck or whatever get it into the water right yeah that makes sense to me it just seems like a a very extreme reaction to not a lot of damage or stuff going on that that's the thing the sounding rod on board makes me want to go oh it's because of the water below decks but this briggs was an experienced captain right he must have known that it was very dangerous to leave the ship unless something really bad was going on and he must have known that a little bit of water didn't necessarily mean he was sinking yeah. So it's it's very strange. Um, little epilogue on the Mary Celeste. After this, she was sold to another group of New York businessmen in 1874, and then to a group of Boston businessmen in 1880. Um, she regularly lost money plying the Indian Ocean route until November 1884, when Captain Gilman Parker, one of the uh, this Boston group, filled the ship with largely useless cargo and purposely ran her onto a reef off of Haiti, wrecking the Mary Celeste beyond repair once and for all. He had listed the cargo as valuable goods and insured it for $30,000. So insurance fraud. $860,000 in today's money. Um, Yes, insurance fraud. And obviously he was caught, charged with fraud and conspiracy and willful ship abandonment, which is actually... A capital crime. Really? Yeah. Um, ultimately, he didn't. He wasn't executed for it. Um, he only had to repay the insurance back to the insurance company. But uh, he did die, humiliated and bankrupt, just three months after the verdict. Yikes! So maybe Captain Gilman Parker was one last victim of the Mary Celeste curse. Hmm. And we're going to return with uh, some more modern cases of ghost ships after the break. Spooky. Welcome back. When last we left you, we heard the tragic tale of the Mary Celeste, the tragic and mysterious tale of the Mary Celeste, a ship whose entire crew vanished somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. Mm. Uh, We also heard earlier about the the Flying Dutchman carry, and I mentioned that was the other kind of ghost ship, the kind that's actually a spectral um, vision of of the dead or or of something else. Mm -hmm. What I've got for you now to close out this episode is a story that's a little bit of both. Yay! It is a little bit of the uh, modern uh, vanished crew kind of ghost ship, and maybe... Just maybe, it's also something a little spectral. This is the SS Valencia. She was a passenger steamer built for service from New York to Venezuela. Uh, She was running passengers up and down the West Coast when she was temporarily diverted to the San Francisco-Seattle route in January 1906, not her normal waters. Uh, She departed January 20th, 1120 a.m. with nine officers, 56 crew, and at least 108 passengers. The Valencia was a, I mean, you know, a big multi-tower steamship, Mm -hmm. like Titanic. Not nearly as big. It seems like it would be a quick trip, San Francisco to Seattle, versus something like New York to Venezuela. Uh, Yeah, just a couple of days, I think. Maybe three days at the most this uh, trip was supposed to be. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, She departed January 20th at 11.20 a.m., and it was early in the morning of January 21st when she was passing Cape Mendocino that weather conditions started to deteriorate. 
Um, when they left, everything was clear, but now they were dealing with low visibility and a strong wind from the southeast. Um, clouds overhead, the crew couldn't use the stars to navigate, and with the heavy winds, Valencia ended up missing the entrance to the strait she was supposed to um, get into, mm -hmm. and instead struck a reef 11 miles off of Cape Beale. Hmm. This is on uh, Vancouver Island. Okay. And here's where um, horror, not the ghost and vampire kind of horror, Carrie, but real life horror um, starts, because immediately after the crash... Uh, the ship it was entirely lifted and dragged by a massive wave. Oh, God. Stretching the gash in the hull, basically, you know, halfway down the length of the ship. Mm -hmm. uh, the captain quickly ordered the ship run aground so she couldn't sink. But all the crew managed to do was succeed in bouncing her off of more rocks, putting mm -hmm. more ho holes in the hull, and stranding the boat 100 yards from the shore. How far is that about? I'm very bad with distances. It's it's, uh, it's a football field. Okay. It's 300 feet. And the waters are rough. Cold. Cold and rough. Cold and choppy. This is Canada. Can, you know, Western Canada. Yeah, so swimming a football field might be fine leisurely in the bay, but in this case, it's deadly. Now, for the at least 100 passengers on, at least 108 passengers on board. It seems like uh, second and third class passengers weren't well counted or kept track of. Mm -hmm. So at least 108, but we're not really sure how many more there might have been. Um, there were seven lifeboats on board. Uh, again, how, how many can they fit? I'm not sure, but it didn't matter much because against the captain's orders, six of the seven lifeboats were launched almost immediately. None of them with the correct number of people. This makes me think of Titanic. Yeah. These these boats were were weighed in Belfast with the weight of seventy men. Yeah, that's right. Un unfilled, just people basically escaping as best as they could, and doing their best to just eject the boats without help from crew or officers. Or so of the boats that launched, three of them flipped on their way down just spilling the people inside into the sea Ugh. where they drowned or, or died of frostbite. God. Uh, two of the boats capsized the moment they hit the water and one disappeared shortly after they saw it hit, uh, hit the bottom. So they didn't bother with the last one? The last boat, they then started trying to load in an orderly fashion so they could use it the way it was intended. So it just disappeared, the sixth one? Uh, we'll get to the men who were in that boat in a moment. Oh, okay. Oh, in a little while. Um, because we might know what happened to that last boat. The scene after that, with all the lifeboats gone, deteriorated pre pretty quickly. Um, one survivor, Chief Freight Clerk Frank Lane, says, uh, said, Screams of women and children mingled in an awful chorus with the shrieking of the wind, the dash of rain, and the roar of the breakers. As the passengers rushed on deck, they were carried away in bunches by the huge waves that seemed as high as the ship's mastheads. The ship began to break up almost at once, and the women and children were lashed to the rigging above the reach of the sea. It was a pitiful sight to see frail women wearing only nightdresses, with bare feet on the freezing raft lines, trying to shield children in their arms from the icy wind and rain. Oh, God. Um... Frank Bunker and 11 other men made it to the shore, I think just by swimming. No, that, that can't be. I mean, it could be by swimming it if they swam fast. A hundred yards, maybe. But it says as soon as they made the beach. Uh, so 12 men managed to make it to shore. Yeah, it said 12 men made it. So maybe some, some guys died on the swim across. Yeah. Um, as soon as they hit the beach, three of these 12 men were immediately washed away by the massive waves. Jesus. The nine remaining men, Frank Bunker, eight other guys, scaled the cliffs. This is like, you remember when we watched the Guns of Navarone? <laughs> yeah. This is like that. These guys scale the cliffs, and on their way up, they find a telegraph line. And they follow that a few miles into the woods. This is hellish. Oh, my God. Find the lineman's cabin and uh, telegraph for help. Uh, pretty heroic stuff. Bunker and co... <laughs> This uh, is insane. But they would actually later get criticized 
for uh, leaving the ship. For not trying to climb higher, because there was a higher up cliff uh, that might have been able to re- be reached by the ship's Lyle gun, which could have shot a line up there. But they didn't think of that. They were just, you know, fuck these guys for trying to go get help, right? L- literally, like, three hellish things to do in a row. You are you make it to shore through the freezing, choppy water that is sweeping people off of the boat. Mm-hmm. Then you scale cliffs. Then you go a couple miles, still freezing, still in terrible weather, into a forest. Mm-hmm. But, but they're pissed. I mean, like... Can you climb higher than that? Can you do what these guys did? No. Like. Meanwhile, what, what do you do if you're still aboard that ship? The the boatswain and a crew of volunteers decided that, look, there's no point. This is a, a horrifying thing to say, but there's no point in using this last lifeboat as intended. There's no way to get all of the women and children into it, right? So they decided to try to use it to save everyone. Um, the boatswain and a crew of, um, you know, able bo- able-bodied volunteers uh, jumped into the last lifeboat and set out to try to find a safe landing spot for the ship and um, catch a line from the Lyle gun, the same grappling hook Batman gun that uh, uh, people were complaining that these other guys should have been catching a line from. So they left the women and children basically lashed to the ship... Yep, it, with the the captain was still back there too. It's not like there were no yes. sailors and officers. And they left to try and figure out a place to like bring the ship. Yeah, uh, they, they ideally find a safe path through the rocks that the ship can actually um, uh, maybe uh, sail through to ground itself before it sinks. Okay. And the, that's why you would you'd fire this line from this big grappling hook gun, right? And then you tow the ship in. And that works? That get, that line thing? Well, it'll at least keep it from drifting further out to sea, right? And then uh, You'd need really good aim, right? Yeah, I guess. I've never heard of this Lyle <laughs> I gun mean, before. Either. It, it is very Batman to it me. It seems crazy. Um, so the boatswain and the volunteers made it to shore in the lifeboat. And upon landing, uh, they found a sign that said three miles to Cape Beale. So they decided, well, screw the original plan. I don't see a safe place for the ship to land. Let's not search for one. Let's just hike to Cape Beale and get help. So they hiked for two and a half hours uh, to a lighthouse up at the Cape. And they uh, told the lighthouse keeper about, you know, the wreck. Uh, The lighthouse keeper was happy to call it in, of course, but um, news had already reached the mainland thanks to the telegraph operator. Okay. So help was finally on its way. The SS Queen... The salvage steamer Salvor and the tug Czar were all sent to help. And the steamer City of Topeka came later from Seattle with supplies and doctors. Mm. Uh, The two remaining life rafts on board the ship were launched when ships were seen on the horizon. These aren't the full lifeboats, right? These are, I don't know if they're inflatable or what, but they're smaller uh, life rafts. Um, So ships were seen on the horizon. It was like, okay, folks, we, we can get some people onto these life rafts. The majority of passengers, though, they've had a very long day, to say the least. They opted to stay put since they could see help was on its way. Mm-hmm. Um, however, after and, and the boats were launched like half full and less than half full, those last two life rafts. Um, it then transpired that none of the rescue ships could safely approach due to both the continuing bad weather and their lack of depth charts for the reef. Uh, one of those two rafts that were launched was eventually picked up by the Topeka, carrying 18 men. The other one washed up on an island in Barkley Sound with four survivors who were nursed to health by First, First Nation, uh, you know, villagers, tribe wow. members, and taken to the nearest village. Um, meanwhile, the ships left because they couldn't get close to the wreck anyway and sent for overland help. Uh, a rescue party arrived at the cliffs overlooking the wreck, the same Guns of Navarone cliffs, right? Um, and they described dozens of passengers clinging to the Valencia's rigging and hull as she lay out in the bay. At this point, why didn't they do the, the gun thing? Um, they The grappling hook thing. I'm not sure if they tried or not, but it couldn't reach the cliffs. 
The ship's funnel collapsed soon after the rescuers arrived, allowing waves to wash over the deck completely unimpeded. And at that point, the rescue party could do nothing but stand there and watch as a big wave pushed the wreckage further out to sea, and the remaining passengers drowned, were beaten to death against the rocks, oh, or, or swept out to sea, clinging to debris, where they slowly died of hypothermia. It's horrible. The official death toll of the Valencia was 136. There were only 37 male survivors. Every woman and child on board was killed. <sighs> Boy. As the city of Topeka transported the survivors back to Seattle, um, they saw another ship passing by and stopped to, um, you know, give the horrible news of what had happened. Uh, and people aboard that ship that the city of Topeka spoke to said they saw the ghostly shape of the doomed Valencia in Topeka's steam clouds as she pulled away. Interesting. Now, a couple months after the wreck, a First Nations fisher named Klanawa Tom and uh, his wife reported finding a lifeboat uh, stuck in a nearby cave and crewed by eight skeletons. Oh, God. The mouth of the cave that the lifeboat was in was blocked by a, a large boulder that would have been tough or impossible to climb over. Mm -hmm. But Tom suspected a high tide had lifted the lifeboat in. Um, it was way too dangerous, uh, both in swimming and climbing, to try to recover it. Um, but anyway, by that one man's account, that's where that last lifeboat ended up. Uh, meanwhile... Ever since, local fishermen have reported seeing lifeboats rowed by skeletons around the bay. Oh, Jesus. And occasionally a black form on the horizon that they swear is the ghost ship Valencia. I know we have one inside all of us, but skeletons are scary in <laughs> yes. general. You, you, and the, <laughs> you were really shaken by the idea of a... a just imagine, imagine you're just kind of chilling out or you're on a boat, you're drinking your daiquiri, and then you see a ghostly rowboat full of skeletons. Yeah. Absolutely not. You yeah, know, that's a lot. That's so much. <laughs> that's so scary. It's horrible. Um, so th that is the harrowing story of the SS Valencia. How is that not a movie? Uh, because it's uh, there's no happy ending. What what kind of a movie is that? I mean, Titanic doesn't have a happy ending. No, the there is a story that we'll do next week that I think absolutely must be a. Um, there's actually maybe a couple of stories that we're going to do next week that I think absolutely must be a movie. Um, because next week on the podcast, well, actually, hold on. Let's, let's put a pin in the, in the Valencia for the time being. Um, any final thoughts, Carrie? I think in the same way that you are terrified of air travel, um, the idea of a, a ship sinking like this terrifies me in that same visceral way. What a, a horrible place to be. A horrible way to go to. I mean, Titanic, you know, it's got that story built in of just its grandiosity and the amount of people and stuff. But just you imagine basically what happened with the Titanic, but like add in the terrible weather and like seeing hope on the horizon, assuming you're going to be rescued. The, the idea that people declined that only four people got on that one life raft yeah. because they were just like, well, there's boats. Yeah. And it's the opposite where in Titanic, it was women and children first. And those were the bulk of the survivors. No women and children survived this, which is just horrible. I mean, you know, no life is greater than another. But just imagining the, the mothers holding their kids lashed to these masts, just trying to comfort them. And oh, it's horrible. And if... If people had just kept calm heads and not launched every lifeboat at once right at the beginning, you, you wonder how many lives would have been saved. Absolutely. Oof. What a horrible story. Yeah. Well, sorry to bring it down. Um, Has anyone... So, so sometimes people even now will see these ghostly visions? Yes. I couldn't tell you when the most recent sighting was, but uh, yes, it, it is an area legend now. Skeleton rowboats. That's so scary. The skeleton robots are pretty scary. Um, <laughs> Imagine seeing that in broad daylight, too. I know. 
Absolutely not. I know. Um, now, stories of the spectral style of ghost ship uh, become less common the further into the 20th century you get, as uh, honestly, a lot of ghost legends find become harder to track down and nail down as you get uh, into the 20th century. Mm-hmm. Um, but we do have three more ghost ship stories for you, uh, all more modern, all from the latter half of the 20th century. And we're going to get into all of them next week because uh, that's right, Carrie, we are, it, this is a two week voyage. <laughs> Well, plenty can happen in two weeks. Look what happened in three days. Yeah. Oh, and looking at my clock here, my record clock, it it might just be a three-hour tour between the two weeks. Oh, boy. It's Lizard People Big World. Thanks to machine learning technology, the identity of Q, a.k.a. the originator of QAnon, the American far-right conspiracy theory and political movement, centered around claims that a cabal of satanic, cannibalistic sexual abusers of children operate a global sex trafficking ring. Ah, that old chestnut. And conspired against Donald Trump against his term as president. This identity may have finally been revealed. Hmm... Over the weekend, the New York Times reported on the findings of two independent teams of forensic linguists who both share their belief in the true identity of Q. So everyone's on the same page. Uh, These two teams are. (laughs) They researched separately and they came to the same conclusion. They say that Q originated as South African software developer Paul Ferber, who was one of the first to draw attention to the QAnon conspiracy theory, and eventually became Ron Watkins, admin of the message board 8kun, uh, K-U-N, <laughs> where QAnon flourished, uh, eventually joining in. He collaborated with Ferber at first and then later took over the account himself when it moved to post on his father Jim Watkins' message board 8chan. Right. And if you saw, I think there was a CNN sort of documentary series on QAnon, and Jim and Ron Watkins definitely figured into that. Yes, uh, we mentioned them on our Q uh, episode as well. Yes, on Pizzagate, our fourth episode in the Satanic Panic series we did, if you want to go back and check. Yes. So two teams of Sw- uh, Swiss and French research. <laughs> Let me start that again. Two teams of Swiss and French researchers used different methodologies to come to the same conclusion. Both techniques fall under the approach of stylometry, which analyzes writing in a way that is measurable, consistent, and replicable uh, according to Engadget. So even though it's objectively like qualitative stuff, they're trying to make it as quantitative as they can? Pretty much. Among all of the possible authors, both teams said the writing of Ferber and Watkins stood out the most due to the strong similarities with that of Q. Machine learning software was previously used to identify Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling as the true writer of the book The Cuckoo's Calling, which she released in 2013 under the pseudonym Robert Galbraith. Now that's uh, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Experts, including the computer scientist who identified Rowling in the earlier case, told the New York Times they find these findings credible and persuasive. For their part, both of the men issued denials to the Times with Watkins, who is currently running for Congress in Arizona. (laughs) Of course he is. Terrifying. Uh, He stated, I am not Q. (laughs) (laughs) And Ferber said that he was influenced by Q's posts to change the style of his writing. (laughs) Fuck off! (laughs) Linguistic experts, however, have countered Ferber's claim by saying this was essentially impossible. (laughs) So the researchers told the Times that they hoped in revealing the true identities of Q that the conspiracy theory would loosen its hold on people. Well, the only thing that they've proved in the eyes of a true believer, though, is that they are on the government's payroll, right? I guess. So I mean, I'm just saying there's no way you can Oh, there's always... With... Yeah, there's always a way that they'll... Yeah. There's always another another step of uh, of backdoor. Yeah, but there it is. Q, are you? 
Cue, 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 cue. I really want to know. That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary. And check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain't it scary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five star review on Apple Podcasts and also now on Spotify. We'll be forever grateful. Yes, and come and join us on Patreon. A lot of fun extra content over there. And we uh, always give special love and thanks to our top tier patrons. Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, Robin McCabe, Comfy Mike, Alex Nakutis, Ryan Regan, and Christy Atchison. Thanks, guys. We love you very much. See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe. Music by Kyle Ryan. You can find Kyle at his YouTube channel, Music is a Verb. This has been a production of Longboy Media. What? <laughs>